The day has finally come for me to step out of my comfort zone and take on a challenge that, according to my most recent Twitter poll, has specifically stopped over 75% of people from even attempting it because it's so damn big. One Piece, the magnum opus of one mangaka, Aichiro Oda. Since 1997, this man has been spending what I can only assume is every waking hour of his life drawing this manga series because, as I'm writing this video, there are almost 1,000 chapters available to read. This man has dedicated his life to this story, and so in order for me to even stand a chance, I need to throw caution to the wind to bring a manga every single place I go, and I need to tell my girlfriend I love her because I won't be seeing her for the next five months. I know nothing about this this series, I have never in my life watched a single episode or read a single chapter of the story. I am a simple Dragon Ball fan exploring for the very first time the most popular and girthy Shonen Jump manga of all time. More popular than Naruto, more popular than Galgo 13, even more popular than Dragon Ball. This is my first impression of the greatest high seas adventure manga has to offer. Today I review Aichiro Oda's modern epic, One Piece. In this video, I will be reviewing the beginning of One Piece's story all the way to the end of the Barity arc, which takes us about 68 chapters into the manga. What can I say? The journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, and my adventure starts now. Oh, also, I'll be reading the manga, and for my editor's sanity, he'll be using corresponding footage from the anime. Enjoy. Romance Dawn, chapters 1 to 7. The series begins in what I believe to be a fantastic fashion. We are shown the last king of the pirates meeting his end, Gold Roger, with his last words acting as a challenge to the rest of mankind to find his legendary treasure, the fabled One Piece. Title drop. A new age of piracy kicks off and that's when we are introduced to Luffy, our main character, as a small child, literally stabbing his eye in the middle of a tavern full of pirates to earn their respect. All right, so the promise of legendary pirate treasure and now our main character's first action is to stab himself in the face to earn street cred. This story sure knows how to grab your attention and to set up a goal right off the bat. In this tavern, immediately after Luffy's <clears throat> introduction, we are introduced to a colorful cast of pirate characters led by the endearing and fun Captain Red-Haired Shanks. Luffy and Shanks have known each other for a number of years at this point, indicated by the teasing Shanks does to Luffy and the rapport they both seem to share for each other. Luffy desperately wants to be a pirate, but concerned for his safety and considering he can't swim, Captain Shanks consistently refuses in a variety of different means. Suddenly, however, some thugs roll up to the bar and begin stirring up some trouble, leading to a bottle of alcohol Shanks had offered in good faith being smashed over his head. Shanks elects to do nothing about this and the group of thugs leave the tavern angry. This all takes place as Luffy was eating right next to him at the bar. And unable to understand that Shanks chose not to fight for the sake of peace, Luffy becomes incredibly disillusioned at Shanks' actions. About to walk off in a huff, they discover that the fruit Luffy had eaten happened to be some of the treasure they had brought home. A magical devil fruit that now gave him the ability to stretch his limbs. With one major drawback, he is now cursed to never be able to swim. N not exactly ideal. Some time passes and the next day, Luffy finds himself alone in the tavern once again. Shanks is leaving for good this time and Luffy is not going to see him off. He still considers him a coward for not standing up for himself, but now's his chance to restore order to the universe because that bully rolls up to the bar once again. The scene switches to the tavern lady looking for help as Luffy receives a massive beating at the hands of this thug leader by the name of Higume the Bear. And despite Luffy's unwavering tenacity, he's being beaten to a pulp. Things are looking dire, but then, a gun gets held up to Shanks' head by one of the thugs. This leads to his crew immediately taking action, and the quick fashion with which Shanks takes care of these vile individuals is wonderfully cathartic. However, in the chaos, Higuma had made off with Luffy to the harbor in an attempt to drown him. Things are never as straightforward as this though, and as fast as you can blink, a sea monster erupts from the depths beneath, eating Higuma and the boat itself, launching Luffy into the ocean, where he finds himself once again saved by Shanks, who in the process of saving him from this sea monster, loses his arm. Feeling terrible about it, Luffy asks, what about your arm? Shanks responds, it's a small price to pay. It's just an arm, I'm glad you're okay. Luffy vows to be king of the pirates and Shanks gives him his hat. 
a hat that he says means a lot to him. He asks him to please return it to him someday when he's become a great pirate. And it's this brave individual in Shanks and his token to remember him by that influences the rest of Luffy's life. He's going to be the king of the pirates one day. He will return Shanks' hat and he will make his life worth the brave sacrifice Shanks made for him by finding the legendary treasure no one has been able to find. Gold Rogers, One Piece. What a character introduction and what an opening for this story. I sincerely loved it. Following these events, there's a bit of a time skip where we catch up with Luffy 10 years later. He's grown up considerably and is far more comfortable now with his Rubberman powers. And just as determined as ever, he ventures into the ocean, completely unprepared considering he has no idea how to navigate, he can swim, and he has no destination other than to find and recruit crew members for his ship, which, let I remind you, he doesn't have yet. Effectively, he has nothing and is starting with only his abilities and positive attitude. Things quickly, however, take a for the worst as they do in One Piece, when we see Luffy sucked into a whirlpool before cutting to a young cabin boy called Kobe working under the lady pirate Iron Mace Alvida. He hates working for her and in the middle of bringing a barrel that had washed up onto the beach back to base, Luffy explodes from it and together Kobe helps Luffy navigate to where he needs to go and Luffy helps liberate this young man from the servitude he despises to help him realize his dream of working for the navy. Together they overthrow the lady captain Alvida, commandeer a dinghy and make headway for a nearby naval base wherein Luffy expresses interest, assuming he's a good guy, in recruiting a highly infamous and reputable pirate hunter that goes by the name of Zoro. Without much delay, they arrive at the naval base and find Zoro held captive, tied to a stake, starving himself in a yard. The design of this character is, I think, fantastic. At a glance, you can immediately tell what sort of character this guy is and the personality he possesses. And when thinking back over this series so far, Oda has put a ton of care into his designs for the characters. If someone is vain and nasty, he makes them incredibly ugly. If someone is scared and unassuming, he emphasizes that feature. And in the case of Zoro, this guy is confident and damn cool. Within moments of meeting this character, we are also introduced to the naval captain's son, Helmeppo, an incredibly selfish, cowardly, and irredeemable character who provides us our window into the naval base's corrupt leadership situation, under the rule of the tyrannical Captain Morgan who is nothing like his son. Through flashbacks, we learn what Zoro has been fighting and searching for, a promise he made to his one-time childhood rival to become the greatest swordsman in all the world before they died. Despite having an intimidating reputation across the area, the entire reason Zoro is tied up in the first place is for protecting a young girl from Captain Morgan's son's attack dogs. Luffy decides he likes the cut of Zoro's jib and asks him to be part of his pirate crew. However, he quickly declines, saying that he has plans of his own, going on to explain that Helmeppo said he only has to survive one month for his freedom. Luffy doesn't like this, but has to accept his decision before heading down to the village where he learns from Helmeppo himself that Zoro will be executed very soon. Enraged by this news, Luffy clobbers the obnoxious coward leading to Helmeppo reporting Luffy to his father, the evil and imposing. Captain Morgan. With this news, Luffy immediately runs and tries to free Zoro, but Zoro is reluctant to believe. Taking the initiative, Luffy then begins searching for Zoro's famous weapon, the sword. While he's searching, Kobe reveals to Zoro that the Navy have no intention of releasing him and that he's up for execution very soon. Kobe tries to free him, but it's too late. Morgan has arrived with his firing squad who open fire on the two of them. Thankfully and surprisingly, falling from the sky comes Luffy, who, using his amazing Rubberman powers, blocks all of the bullets and also returns the, count them, three swords belonging to Zoro. This guy fights with three swords. No big deal. Together, they team up to fight and overthrow the evil Captain Morgan, returning the Navy to its former glory. Kobe stays behind to follow his dream of becoming a naval officer, and Zoro decides to join Luffy's crew in return for saving his life, still vowing to be the greatest swordsman to have ever lived, while also continuing his pursuit of a particular individual widely known as the greatest swordsman in the world. Orange Town Arc, chapters 8 to 24. This story picks up right after the events of the last one as Zoro and Luffy float around starving because neither can navigate and neither have food, it seems. That is until they see a bird. Luffy jumps up to catch it, but soon realizes that this bird is much, much bigger than he first anticipated, and thus it carries him away until he reaches Orange Town, where he falls into the life of a pirate thief called Nami. In the middle of running away from some pirates, she swindled out of a very valuable item, a map to the Grand Line, a secret but very dangerous area of the world that presumably is filled with unspeakable riches and perhaps might even be the location of Gold Roger's legendary treasure, One, One Piece. Piece. 
While this is all happening, Zoro discovers three pirates marooned on a defunct boat floating in the middle of open ocean. They explain that this random girl pretended to be starving and desperate to lure them in, and when the moment presented itself, she stole their boat and treasure. Zoro decides to help them out and brings them back to their base on Orange Town. They explain that they are part of a notorious pirate crew led by the fabled pirate captain, Buggy the Clown, who is easily the best designed villain we have seen so far. I absolutely adore him. Anyways, after taking refuge from the pursuing pirates in an abandoned home on the island, Nami explains to Luffy that she specializes in robbing pirates and that this Buggy the Clown is not someone to take lightly. He's terrorized this town with monstrous cannons and destruction to the point it's almost being completely deserted. And legend has it, he also has mysterious powers. Apparently, the townspeople are after moving a distance away to avoid these pirate activities too. Nami explains that she hates pirates and that once she gets 100 million berries, which I assume is their currency, she will buy, quote, a certain village. And after learning of this and her ability to navigate effectively on the open water, Luffy is excited to ask her to be part of his pirate crew. She immediately declines however and reveals that she had no idea that Luffy was in fact a pirate. This exchange between the two characters of how they came to meet up is full of character and delivers exposition for the respective situations fine enough, but at this point in my read through, I became very annoyed at a particular pattern I began to notice. Oda seems to have a particular writing quirk during this period of the story where he will naturally explain the goals, the plan and the motivations of a particular circumstance, and that is all vital information for the reader or viewer to understand. And to be perfectly honest, he delivers it rather well. But he does this thing where he either has Luffy say he doesn't understand or wasn't listening, leading to that plan once again being repeated in much simpler terms anticipating that maybe a reader wasn't listening. It honestly didn't bother me the first time I saw it, but it's starting to become a trend and I think it shows a lack of confidence in either his writing or the reader's ability to understand his writing. Honestly comes off as a little clunky to me. In addition to that, he seems to love this sort of panel structure. It's funny when it's used sparingly, but man does he use this framing and gag a lot in the story early on. Within the first 10 chapters, he must have used it dozens and dozens of times. But anyways, back to the story. Seeing an opportunity to leverage Luffy's innocence for her own personal gain, she agrees to be Luffy's navigator on the condition he helps her with Buggy the Clown. She is, of course, lying. Luffy immediately agrees, but once they arrive, she ties him up with the rope she always seems to carry with her and offers him up to Buggy, explaining that he was her boss before expressing an interest in joining his crew instead. These are all, of course, lies to create an opportunity to nab his treasure. I honestly love Nami as a character. She feels very believable and utilizes all of her strengths to achieve what she wants. She might be my favorite. As the scene progresses, Luffy is thrown into a cage and Nami is left into Buggy the Clown's pirate crew. While all of that is happening, Zoro lands on the shore of Orange Town with the three pirates he saved, and together they lead him to Buggy's hideout. As things progress back at the hideout, however, it soon becomes obvious that Buggy is going to take Luffy's life. This isn't at all what Nami wanted, and when forced to make the decision to prove her loyalty by firing a cannon to wipe him off the face of the earth, she declines and begins fighting. This isn't at all what she thought would happen, and she's not going to become what she hates. Things admittedly are looking pretty bad, but that's when... Okay, that was awesome, but unfortunately Buggy's mysterious powers alluded to earlier came from consuming a similar devil fruit to what Luffy did. And so he has the ability to disassemble and reassemble himself. Due to this unexpected trait, Zoro lowers his guard long enough to sustain a serious injury. Outnumbered, trapped, and now gravely injured, Luffy and Zoro quickly come up with a plan of escape. They point the cannon at the group of pirates, and when it fires, Zoro lifts the cage, housing Luffy to safety. A righteous bravery and selfless rescue that really takes Nami by surprise. And what follows this was honestly incredibly unexpected, in a brilliant way. As Luffy and Zoro are trying to figure out their next move, after having escaped, they notice a dog barking at the front of a pet food store. The mayor of the town, one of the last residents still in the town, explains that now the dog's master is deceased and that his last order was for his loyal pupper to protect the store while he was gone. To that little dog, that building is his treasure. What a beautiful metaphor and perfectly fitting for One Piece. I've only briefly touched on this particular story thread here, but the story behind it actually made me cry. I'm a sucker for a loyal dog story 
story and this was beautiful and tragic all at the same time. I've never in my life cried while reading before and One Piece certainly brought an end to that streak. The remainder of this arc is pretty much its third act. Buggy unleashes his subordinates to find and deal with Luffy and Zoro, the latter of whom has managed to find refuge with the mayor of the town. One of Buggy's lackeys happens to be a lion tamer to keep up with the circus theme and despite the little dog's best efforts to protect the only thing left behind by his now deceased master. The tamer and his lion beat the living daylights out of the dog, leaving behind nothing but a burning building. I need Luffy to bring justice to the world now. And bring justice to the world, he most certainly does. But unfortunately, the damage has already been done. All that's left is ash and a single box of food. Luffy sits next to the little dog and gives that to him. Nami realizes in that moment that Luffy had fought the lion specifically for that little dog. Throughout this arc, the through line has been the light in which Nami views Luffy. While he having nothing to prove to her specifically, by simply being who he is, Luffy demonstrates enough to dissuade or at the very least inject some doubt into her perceived notions about the young pirate. The remainder of the arc is full of more selfless sacrifice and rescue, mainly by Luffy, who protects the town's mayor with the help of Nami and a beautiful callback to the fact that she always carries rope with her, ultimately leading to Buggy's defeat. Oh, and there's this scene where Luffy kicks the disembodied groin of Buggy to stop his other body parts in their tracks, which I honestly found a little more funny than I probably should have. And to cap it all off, when the townspeople finally return to chase off the pirates, Luffy and Zoro are forced to flee. But the little dog, who was once aggressive towards these guys, now stands to valiantly protect them from the mob. What a beautifully crafted little story about personal treasure, prejudice, and trust. I love it. And on top of all of that, despite not fully committing to the crew, Luffy and Zoro now have a navigator in Nami who has agreed to travel to the Grand Line together as it's both a worthwhile endeavor and mutually beneficial. Syrup Village Arc, chapters 24 to 41. The portion of the show that I've reviewed thus far has clearly been in a casual recruitment phase wherein Luffy assembles his ragtag group of personalities to accompany him on his adventures around the world. And this arc is no different. In the same way the last couple stories centered around the recruitment of Zoro and Nami, this one centers around the recruitment of a slingshot-wielding troublesome town liar named Usopp. And unfortunately, of the arcs I'm covering in this video, I enjoyed this one the least. But that's not to say this wasn't good or that I didn't enjoy it. It's probably more to do with the fact it's sandwiched between the last arc, which I thought was great, and the next one, which is really, really good. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. This particular story continues as Nami, Zoro, and Luffy are sailing along the sea in their tiny boat. They all notice a distinct lack of provisions as well as the inadequate sailing vessel they possess, and so touching down on land, they endeavor to find a remedy to all of these issues. This is when we cut to the man of the hour, Usopp, who seems to enjoy pretending that pirates are attacking his town in what seems to be an attempt to rile up trouble in his neighborhood. If it's starting to sound like a variation on the boy who cried wolf story, that's because it is, but with a distinct pirate twist. You see, despite being a notorious liar, he also has a small group of children that act as his pirate crew, but upon seeing Luffy and the gang touch down on the beach, the children bail, leading to Usopp eventually inviting the gang for food. There he explains a bit about the town and the local affluent residence owned by a sickly young orphan named Kaya. And it turns out Usopp has a wonderful relationship with her. Despite him not exactly being well liked by the village due to his lying, the wonderful stories he fabricates for the young mistress Kaya makes her very happy, much to the dismay of her butler, Klahador, it's a strange name, who at every turn tries to dissuade Kaya from interacting with the likes of Usopp. Coming to a head one day when Usopp, despite being told not to, travels to her window to regale her once again with fantastical stories of adventure and fun. While this is happening, Luffy decides that the best course of action would be to ask Kaya for a ship himself, because that's what grown-ups do. I guess if you don't ask, you won't receive. However, by the time he arrives at the property, Klahador is reprimanding and belittling Usopp for trespassing on her land, taking things too far by attacking Usopp's personal character and his father's legacy. Leading to, some would say, a fair reaction of Usopp punching him in the face, storming off at the behest of Kaya who got deeply upset at the violence. While this is all happening, a character called Django, who is heavily inspired by a certain pop star, let's see if you can guess who by this subtle clue, moonwalks down the road until he meets the three young boys from Usopp's crew, revealing that he's a sort of hypnotist. Meanwhile, Luffy catches up to Usopp, who has decided to run to a secluded spot overlooking the ocean. There, he tries to console Usopp by letting him know that he knew his father and considered him a great man. Things are going rather smoothly until they hear chatter from down below on the beach. It's Django, the hypnotist from earlier, 
Junior and Clahador the Butler. While eavesdropping from above, they overhear a sinister plot that involves taking all of Kaya's family fortune and ransacking the village. It turns out Clahador's real name is Captain Kuro, a vicious and feared pirate thought to have been sentenced to death years ago. In reality, he has been playing the long con in an attempt to start a fresh reputation disconnected from the horrible things he's done so that he can do more unspeakable things in the future. Apparently the plan is to hypnotize Kaya and to have her sign over her family's fortune and to sack the village. The plan is perfectly fine, but the way it's delivered felt pretty unnatural and sort of clunky to me. The questions from Jangle felt like they were for the benefit of the viewer and reader and something he should already have the answers to himself. In other words, he shouldn't need to ask about this. Also, the odds of them choosing the spot directly beneath where Usopp and Luffy were was a bit too coincidental for my taste. In addition to that super clear exposition we just received, we get Luffy saying that he can't hear what's being said and Usopp proceeds to break down the entire plot for a second time and we have to read it or listen to it again. Which I still find pretty annoying. But regardless, once Luffy is caught up, he shouts down at them to not do the bad thing and then proceeds to face plant, falling from the cliff to the ground below. Captain Kuro believes the boy to be dead and for Usopp to not have a chance at convincing anyone of anything. Despite this, Usopp tries to make haste by warning the village that pirates are coming in the morning. And they naturally don't believe him shock horror. Instead of cooperating, he gets chased off for his trouble and flees to Kaya's where he tries to warn her and take her to safety. She refuses. Shock horror. Out of time and now out of options, Usopp is left to defend the village alone. That is, until Luffy and the gang offer their services. And while the action supplied for this section doesn't have disembodied nutshots on clowns, it does have Captain Kuro who has big old cat claws and is by far the most ruthless individual we've ever met in the story so far. He takes himself very seriously and I felt a different tension while reading his character. We get some good stuff from Nami and Zoro too, but I think my favorite aspect of this series so far is, while it has its obvious shortcomings to me, they are easily forgiven and alongside them Oda sprinkles moments that remind me that he knows exactly what he's doing when it comes to storytelling. For instance, during a section where Luffy is fighting Clahador, or Captain Kuro, your choice. Usopp is being carried into the forest by Zoro chasing after the Michael Jackson inspired pirate who is chasing after the three young boys and the young girl Kaya. He sets it up such that we are waiting for Usopp and Zoro to arrive to save the day and so while I am watching the kids struggle and set up counterattacks against Django, I am very much waiting for Zoro and Usopp to arrive. Oda knows this and so when they do arrive he sneaks in a counterattack by the little kids I wasn't expecting because I was too busy waiting for Zoro and Usopp. It's these subtle checkoff guns moments that I am honestly most impressed by. It's a very basic swerve to help deliver a conclusion to a fight scene, but you'd be surprised how many don't use it as effectively or as regularly as Oda does. The fights during this section of the story are also really well done. I very much enjoyed the colorful cast and crew members under Captain Kuro and the challenges that they provided Luffy and the gang. On top of that, I thought the fights were served pretty well by the setting of the battle. A shore front and a narrow slipway surrounded by forest. It's a nice little setup. I don't think Captain Kuro was as fun as Captain Buggy he was, but he offered something completely different and, as I pointed out earlier, was far more serious in and of itself, which was very valuable. In the end, Luffy overpowers and outmaneuvers the crazed Captain Kuro, leading to Usopp joining Luffy's crew. He promises to one day return to Kaya and to regale her with tons of true and fantastical stories. As a thanks for their valiant efforts, Kaya supplies them with their very own ship to sail across the sea, complete with provisions. We also get one last tidbit of information about Usopp's past also regarding his mother and the origin behind why he cries pirate. And this is an aspect of this series I've been very much impressed by, and that's its willingness and determination to make you care about these individual characters Luffy ultimately recruits into his misfit band of would-be pirates. Through their respective debut arcs, whether it be Luffy himself, Zoro, Nami, or Usopp, any and every character Oda adds to the group is thoroughly explored and understood by the reader or viewer first and foremost before they join the ranks. So in terms of character writing, I'm very happy with what I'm seeing so far, and I can't wait to see who's joining the crew next. The Barity Arc, chapters 42 to 68. This will be the final arc I'll be discussing today and of the arcs I have read through, this was by far my favorite. But before I start, I should say that this arc was so insanely dense with stuff happening that I've had to omit certain parts and quickly go over others to make room for what I thought to be the most important aspects of this story. 
So let's jump in. While playing with the new cannon on this fancy new ship they've acquired, the crew end up discovering two individuals, Yosaku and Johnny, the former of which was suffering the effects of scurvy. This incident brings to the crew's attention that they require a cook aboard this ship. They eventually come across an ocean-faring restaurant called Barity after they accidentally deflect a cannonball onto the premises, causing a lot of damage, leading to Luffy having to pay off the damages by means of working in their kitchens. Inside this restaurant, we get introduced to the various wacky and oftentimes aggressive cooking staff aboard the Barity, as well as the head chef Zeph, a former pirate that has settled down as the owner of this restaurant, and a particularly interesting character named Sanji, another chef working at the restaurant who happens to be a very capable fighter too, sporting what I believe to be a genius character design, and personally he has a dream of one day finding the all blue sea. However, he remains committed to the kitchen and the restaurant for reasons he refuses to share and despite his abrasive relationships with the majority of the staff working there, insists on remaining in the Barity. He's also a sucker for the ladies, so I hope that gag doesn't get old too fast. Yikes. Once everyone settles down, someone bursts through the door of the main dining hall, announcing that the captive has escaped, followed by that man doing the fall down dance, and the captive rolling up to a chair demanding to be fed. This man's name is Gein, and he gets pulverized and reprimanded for these actions by the restaurant staff. However, not liking the thought of anyone going hungry, Sanji, in privacy, gives Gein food for free. Apparently, this is a trend with him, and naturally, Luffy wants him to join his crew as their cook, but he refuses, citing that he has his own reasons to stay. During this conversation, Luffy explains that he has plans of traveling to the Grand Line, which piques Gein's interest, leading him to warn Luffy never to go there. After this generosity from Sanji, Gein ends up leaving but quickly returns, bursting through the door with the most feared man in all of East Blue on his shoulder, the head honcho of an armada consisting of 50 ships, the feared Don Krieg. However, now on the verge of death, his fleet almost gone, and his flagship in tatters. He's here, but only after barely managing to return from a seven-day trip to the Grand Line during a massive storm. He gets down onto his hands and knees, begging for food and pity, and eventually, Sanji shows mercy and feeds him much to the chagrin of the fellow cooks. After receiving this food and regaining his strength, Krieg immediately beats Sanji to the floor. There's nothing likable about that, and it's honestly a great villain introduction. But he's not done. Much just like he was, his crew is in a shambles and in desperate need of food. He wants to feed them and essentially take over the Barity restaurant ship. He also expresses and reveals that Chef Zeph was once an incredible pirate who managed to successfully navigate and survive on the Grand Line for a year. Unable to do that himself, Krieg wants that logbook of Zeph's trip to help him on his next trip on the Grand Line. This is great because all the people we've met on this journey up to this point have brought up the Grand Line in one form or another. Towards the very beginning, it was a place only suicidal fools traveled to. Then Buggy had planned to go there with his map. Luffy got the map and now we've met our very first person to have actually gone there and returned. And he barely made it out alive. This is a wonderful progression in villains that is measured in the goal we are working towards, the Grand Line. Excellent writing. Gein is honestly taken aback by all of this and apologizes profusely for bringing this upon everyone at the Barity. But Zeph, the head chef, gives Krieg food for his crew, much once again to the chagrin of his various employees. He doesn't want them to go hungry either. Don Krieg then leaves to feed his crew, while the rest of the staff aboard the Barity, consisting largely of fighters and ruffians, begin readying themselves for battle. However, just as soon as they hear Krieg's army of crewmen coming, a massive attack slices the flagship of Don Krieg in half. Completely taken aback by the thunderous sound, they run outside to find Osaku and Johnny in the water as well as the destroyed ship of Krieg's. The two explain that they are in the water not because of what just happened, but because Nami threw them out and made off with their ship, eyeballing a certain bounty list in their possession. Naturally, everyone is shocked by this, and what's worse is that they have someone much, much more dangerous than Don Creek to contend with right now. Slowly approaching their ship is a shadowy figure that Zeph recognizes. Gein explains that while they were on the Grand Line, on the seventh day, Krieg's armada was destroyed by one man, and that if that massive storm hadn't come, their flagship would most definitely have fallen too. Apparently an individual that goes by the moniker Hawkeye is responsible for Krieg's current state of affairs, and it just so happens that this is the same someone Zoro has been looking for for many, many years. First of all, I want to say I friggin love Hawkeye's design here. Just had to get that out, and his introduction is honestly spectacular. It's explained that he's been chasing down Krieg's crew for pretty much fun. They quickly try to shoot him, but Zoro pops up from the crowd and says that bullets won't work. 
that he'll simply deflect them. He also announces that he's been looking for him, that he wants to be the best, and that if he wants some fun, Hawkeye can fight him, pointing his sword directly towards the greatest swordsman in the world. Hawkeye, in response to this, asks where he gets his courage to point this sword. Does it come from confidence or ignorance? Zoro succinctly replies, it comes from ambition and a promise I made to a friend. Incredible line. We then switch scenes and get a glimpse of Nami sailing away crying. Hoping that they'll meet again, she laments, I can't wait to be free. There are so many moving parts to this story and I have no idea what's going on. I honestly love it. I don't know what to expect. Accepting his challenge, Hawkeye whips out a tiny knife saying, I'm not the kind of fool who hunts rabbits with a cannon. Upon reading that line, my mouth fell open and I had to run around the house showing people that line. It might very well be the most Chad thing I've ever read in my life. He explains that the red line and grand line split the seas into four. The east, the south, the north, and the west blue. Going on to say that east blue, their area, is the tamest of the four seas. And that tiny knife is the smallest blade he has. Speaking directly at Zoro, he says, it's time you learn how big the world is. They begin to fight, but Zoro is easily outclassed. He thinks back to the promise he made to that friend when he was a kid to be the greatest swordsman. Hawkeye stabs him in the chest. Zoro still refuses to retreat to safety, because to retreat means defeat, and he'd rather die than to accept that. In doing this, he earns Hawkeye's respect, needing him to bring out his best weapon, a large black sword. Zoro tries again to defend himself, but his swords shatter. Now completely unarmed, he stands facing the greatest swordsman alive, leaving himself now completely open, as a wound to the back is a disgrace to a great swordsman. Hawkeye recognizes his efforts, slashing him to the floor. However, impressed by his honor and bravery, Hawkeye allows Zoro to live. He wants him to travel far and wide to hone his skills and to try to defeat him once again. He thanks Luffy for allowing his crewmate to fight his fight without getting involved, asking him what his dream is. Luffy responds to be the Pirate King. Hawkeye says that's even more perilous than trying to surpass me. Zoro lifts his sword to the air and vows to never lose again. Luffy is honestly happy to see him move and to see that hunger swell within him once again. I love Hawkeye as a character. His design is exceptional and honestly perfect for the setting and the ship he sails directly reflects his philosophy. He's not brash or a show off. He's just phenomenal and recognizes true ambition and dedication in others. And with that, we've finally gotten our first taste of what lies beyond the safety of the East Blue Sea. After this altercation, Johnny Usopp, Yosuka, and a beaten up Zoro decide to follow after the trail of Nami's commandeered ship. Luffy, on the other hand, has elected to stay, and thus will have to find them after he finishes dealing with business here. Once again, after a series of creative and unusual character introductions and fights involving Don Krieg, his pirate crew, and a new character called Invincible Pearl, who also works under Don Krieg, Luffy and Sanji finally start to gain the upper hand when... Oda catches me once again, completely off guard, with Gein taking action like this. Demonstrating to me that he knows exactly what he's doing as a mangaka when it comes to creating surprise and tension in a scene. Gein's been seen largely as a voice of reason amidst the ranks of Don Krieg, and so we, or at the very least I, put him to the back of my head as someone who's not really a threat, but he is still a pirate working for Krieg, so this makes complete sense for him to get involved here in this situation. I'm honestly loving this. He demands Sanji to leave the ship, but he refuses. Invincible Pearl gathers himself again and attacks Sanji, who is now extremely beaten, still refuses to leave. Citing that he's taken everything from that old man, referring to the owner, Zeth, he's taken his strength and his dreams, swearing that he won't let anything else be lost. Hearing this, Krieg's forces once again blindside Sanji, landing a massive attack on the young man. We are then greeted by a flashback from Sanji's past, taking us nine years prior to the events of today as Sanji is a young cook's apprentice on a ship. He's discussing his dream of finding the All Blue Sea, a legendary place that might not exist and is said to have the best fish to cook. Suddenly, their ship gets pillaged by Captain Zeph's crew on the return from the Grand Line. However, things suddenly take a turn for the worst as Sanji is dragged overboard as the storm outside rages on. Without hesitation, Zeph jumps overboard to save him. He never had any intention of taking anyone's life, just to steal some food and valuables. The storm begins to worsen and we cut to a small island that the two have washed up on. Zeph suspects his ship was destroyed and so they should both go to either side of the island to keep an eye out for passing vessels. He places a small sack of food in front of Sanji, explaining that this is his bag of food and that this larger bag is his because he's bigger and therefore needs it. But despite having this bag, we later see Zeph in isolation on the other side of the island, taking action into his own hands, beating his own foot with a rock. 
Sanji, still deeply spiteful of Zeph, but now on his own side, reckons with proper rationing the supply can last 20 days. Unfortunately, days 25, 30, 50, and 70 pass by with only one opportunity presenting itself during impossible weather conditions. At this stage, about to starve, Sanji decides to go to the other side to see if Zeph's situation is any better. He took more food after all, and he sees the bag hasn't changed size. Once Sanji cuts the bag though, it's revealed that it's full of treasure and no food. Sanji then approaches Zeph to find that he's nothing but skin and bone. Missing the lower half of his leg, he cut it off to survive just that little bit longer, giving all of the food to Sanji. Zeph remarks that he liked Sanji because he had the same dream he had, to find the all blue. On day 85, the two were rescued. Zeph saved Sanji's life. After this, the flashback ends and Sanji stands up and declares that he will defend him with his life and repay his debt. The final fight that takes place utilizes all the strengths and weaknesses of both the villains and the heroes, feeding into dramatic character choices, demonstrations, failings, and successes. To say that this is the biggest and most climactic fight attempted by One Piece so far would be an understatement, and if the runtime of this video is any indication, my ability to break down the nuance and style this particular arc graces us with is clearly lacking. And that's not even to mention the choreography, angles, and framing that this final section of the story implements. If I were to fully break down everything that this arc had to offer, this video would probably be about two hours long and I wouldn't be able to release a follow-up for a month. So with that in mind, let's Let's try to wrap things up. With tenacity, grit, and style, both Sanji and Luffy defeat the forces of Don Krieg, later getting carried off by Gein, who thanks both Luffy and Sanji for having saved and spared his life. The following day after the events, Luffy wakes up and both he and Sanji make their way to the dining hall to have some grub. The soup, prepared by Sanji, has everyone in the building gagging, throwing it on the floor, and berating Sanji for having made it. Sanji naturally gets extremely angry at everyone for treating him like this. He confronts Chef Zeph about it too, leading to the chef punching him in the face. You'll never be able to cook like me. I've cooked on all the oceans of the world, he says. Sanji then storms off, and that's when everyone explains that they've done all this to try and convince Sanji to leave with Luffy to follow his dream. Sitting outside the doorway, Sanji hears all of this transpire. Luffy says that he won't take Sanji with him, that he needs to make that decision on his own. Listening to all of this, seemingly at random, Sanji gets hit by a shark from the sky, crashing into the room where Luffy and the others are. In the mouth of this shark is Yosuke, who was last seen in the boat with Usopp, Zoro, and his brother Johnny, explaining that if his calculations are correct, he can take Luffy to where Nami was heading. They decide to go, but before they do, Sanji says that he wants to join them on their adventure and follow his dreams. Luffy rejoices and begins making his way out. But before following the others, Sanji addresses everyone and lets them know that he's aware that they all pretended not to like his soup. As he gets ready, Sanji reflects on his life up until now, how they opened the shop together, how they came to employ all these colorful characters, and all the time he stood up for Zeph. As Sanji makes his way down the deck towards the small boat where Luffy is waiting, everyone is there to watch him leave. The two main chefs try to attack him, but they had no chance. No one else makes a single sound. No goodbyes or anything. Luffy asks if he wanted to say goodbye, but Sanji says no. And that's when Chef Zef says, Hey Sanji, keep your feet dry. A beautifully subtle callback to how he saved him when he fell overboard as a child. Hearing this, Sanji breaks down crying and shouts out that he owes his life to Zef and that he will miss them all. The rest shout the same back to him, and it's a beautiful way to cap off this arc and this video. The level of attention to detail and commitment to fun Oda is having with this story borders on pathological levels of dedication. For instance, I didn't even mention yet, or notice for that matter up until chapter 39, that the pieces of cover art that he does for each individual chapter actually tells their own mini story. The story being Buggy the Clown's escapades after meeting Luffy for the first time. It's hilarious and I literally almost missed it. I think what I might love most about Aichiro Oda can be best summed up by this piece of information my editor shared with me about him. From a very early age, he had a comprehensive grasp of this story, including designs for characters, islands, cultures, and political factions. And perhaps my most favorite aspect of him and this story is that from the moment he started, he's known exactly how he's going to finish it. And now over 20 years into the future, he still has yet to end this mammoth of a journey. I can't wait to continue along on this spectacular adventure, but something tells me I haven't seen anything yet and that my adventure is only just beginning. I've been Totally Not Mark. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next week.